Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the keynote with John Platt. Uh, I am excited to introduce John. Uh, John is a distinguished scientist at Google Research, and he's leading Google's Applied Science Organization. And one of their focus areas is climate change. John has worked in many scientific fields before, from computer graphics and computational geometry to machine learning to quantum computing, just fascinating background. And uh, John also is one of the authors of the Climate Change AI paper called Tackling Climate Change with Machine Learning. And uh, for me personally, seeing the paper and John's talks about this topic inside Google a couple of years ago was my first experience realizing that maybe as an ML engineer, I have something to offer climate. Uh, I hope that the session will have a similar effect on you too. So today, John will present the lessons he has learned from his work applying AI to different fields of climate mitigation and adaptation at Google. Yeah, uh, enjoy. Uh, on to John, please. Thank you, Gene. Um, so uh, uh, the, the topic of how to AI can fight climate change is a very broad and deep one. So it's impossible to cover everything in 40 minutes. Uh, in fact, the climate change that AI folks uh, have entire day-long conferences about there, this where we just scratch the surface. So what I'll try to do is sort of focus on some of the work that I've participated in and observed in Google, and I'll try to share some lessons with you to, uh, that I've uh, derived from all that work. So uh, let's let's start. So uh, I'll briefly go over the problem of climate change and sort of the pickle that we're in right now, uh, which, which lends a bunch of urgency to all this work. And we'll start with fundamentals, which is, uh, well, we want to use AI to fight climate change, but will using the AI, AI actually make the problem worse? Let's, let's sort of assure ourselves that that's not true. Then I'll make a, a side parenthesis, which is, what do you want to do if you want to help, if, if you want to use uh, AI to fight climate change? Then I'll go into at least one example of one application area, which is world modeling, where I, I think AI can be super useful. And I'll do lessons learned throughout the talk, but I'll, I'll try to summarize everything that I've learned. Okay, so let's talk about this, the current state of the climate. So the Earth is a habitable world because of the greenhouse effect. Um, you may not realize it, but the amount of uh, heat energy that uh, is absorbed from by the Earth from the sun is actually less than the amount of heat energy that is sort of cycled back and forth between the ground and the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And this is a good thing because it keeps the Earth land an average of 14 degrees Celsius, and so we can all have a happy planet. The trouble is it's sensitive to perturbations inside the atmosphere. So if you add even uh, uh, 100 parts per million uh, CO2, uh, which we've done to the atmosphere, it, it adds two more watts per square meter uh, beaming heat downwards. But that's, e even though that's a small amount compared to these large flows, that's enough to start heating up uh, the global mean temperature, and that starts causing problems. You can view the atmosphere as a bank, or maybe a debt. Uh, and you put, when you emit CO2 from any human activity, it goes into the atmosphere. Some of it gets absorbed by the ocean. Some of it gets absorbed by the land or the forests, but this, the, the, about um, two thirds of it remains. Um, um, that, and that sticks around for millennia. And so we've been dumping, oh, the equivalent of about, between CO2 and other greenhouse gases, about 50 gigatons a year. And that's slowly increasing, at least if we do business as usual. So because, it sticks around for millennia. You can think of this as a debt that we're just incurring, and there'll be points of no return. So, for example, um, the IPCC has said, oh, two Celsius is the threshold for dangerous climate change. So if we just keep doing what we're doing by, oh, I don't know, 2047, there's no way that we can avoid temperatures above two Celsius. But unfortunately, it's worse than that. This makes us think that we have some number of decades. But there's actually hysteresis in the, in the, human system, right? Uh, because we have all these tr literally trillions of dollars of fossil fuel infrastructure, and it takes a while uh, to unwind that. So let's let's have a scenario where in the year 2030, um, we decide, okay, uh, no more new um, uh, fossil fuel infrastructure or, or greenhouse gas infrastructure at all. Uh, then, we, but we're not going to destroy the old infrastructure. We're just going to let it sort of gradually wear out. That gets you the, the approximately uh, the, the equivalent of about a 3.3% annual reduction. So even if we stop in 2030 building new fossil fuel infrastructure at 1.5 Celsius, unfortunately, it's going to bake in another 0.7 Celsius of warming. So that gets us beyond the danger point. 
we'd have to to really st stomp on the brakes. We'd have to have a 10% annual reduction, which is about what we got just from um, uh, personal actions during the COVID uh, pandemic last year. Um, and then even then at that rapid rate, which might not be achievable year after year, uh, we end up somewhere ab about 1.8 Celsius if we start in 2030. Another way of plotting this is a temperature is a function of start date. So let's assume that um, we're going to go on the uh, you know rapid but not radical path of just at some year Y, we're just going to stop building new infrastructure and let the old stuff decay. What is the final temperature rise above the old uh, uh, pre-industrial temperature? Uh, and the answer is, even if we stop today, we'll hit two Celsius. And that's, again, the threshold uh, you know, the rough threshold for dangerous climate change. And every year we wait after this year, uh, we get ever higher into the into the danger zone. I mean, three degrees uh, could be catastrophic um, and no one even knows whether four degrees is a stable climate or whether there's a runaway uh, there. So uh, the time to act is now, this is the, the 2020s is the critical decade to really stomp on the brakes uh, for climate change. Uh, we have no more time to mess around. So uh, how does one fight climate change? Well, as Eugene mentioned, um, there's two forms of, of fighting. There's climate mitigation where w you, you take some actions and that reduces uh, either that reduces the amount of greenhouse gases that are emitted, um, reduces the radiative forcing, or actually captures some of the CO2 back from the atmosphere. So anything to decrease that temperature uh, uh, march up, upwards. And I'll talk about a little bit about climate mitigation in this talk. I'll talk about the direct carbon footprint that Google has through our computation, which is the, the, the majority of the, the footprint. Um, you can also do climate adaptation, right? If we've already baked in two Celsius, then there, there are going to be harms for, for, from the climate. Uh, there's going to be severe weather damages from heat waves, floods. So I'll talk a little bit about our flood forecasting uh, work, which is a form of climate, climate adaptation. Now, uh, these uh, dot, dot, dots, these ellipses show that there's many other ways of doing uh, climate mitigation and climate adaptation. I only wanted to highlight a couple today and tell you some of the lessons that I've learned, but uh, we're working on other climate mitigation uh, and adaptation uh, methods and the whole world is, is, is investigating many parallel paths to mitigation and adaptation. So let's talk about renewable energy. Renewable energy has um, plummeted in price and that's really promising. And um, it is maybe a, a very major way that we're going to bend the curve on the CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions over the next decade. Uh, renewable energy is electricity that comes from either the sun or wind or hydropower, perhaps some other sources like tidal, as opposed to burning some sort of fossil fuel like coal. Now, the reason why I bring up renewable energy is to talk about the direct carbon footprint of Google. Because let's say we're going to do AI for climate change. Let's make sure that AI isn't adding to the problem, right? That's step one, because you don't want to um, take one step forward and one step back. Um, now, uh, data centers use electricity. So when you train a machine learning model in the cloud, uh, uh, you're going to produce some carbon dioxide. How much? Uh, well, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, even if you train it on your own GPU, you, uh, um, you uh, generate CO2, uh, you'll see that it's actually better to do it uh, in the cloud. So um, here's the first lesson that I've learned about climate change. Uh, climate change boils down to accounting. Uh, you might not think that because you think, well, isn't climate change a, a geophysical uh, property? Well, um, it is, but accounting, this is my snarky definition of accounting. Accounting is the quantified art of assigning costs or perhaps assigning blame. And uh, fixing climate change is going to be an expensive proposition, and that's fine. We should do it because the harms are, worse, are high, much higher than the costs. But we have to figure out how to assign the costs and to make sure that everyone does their part. So here's one example uh, that's very relevant about why accounting is so important for climate change. Um, electricity shared in the grid. All the, the generators just dump their electricity on the grid and all, all of us consumers consume it. And it's not like there are green electrons or black electrons that are, that are segregated on the, on the, the, 
the grid, it's all mixed together. You, you can't tell renewable electrons from coal electrons. Now, Google buys renewable energy in order to, uh, to make sure that all of our all of the energy of our operations is generated by, by uh, renewable sources. But that's all mixed together with other people who generate coal elect electricity and consume it. So how do we keep track of our carbon footprint? How do we keep track and know that we're doing a good job um, uh, you know, being green and, and, and consuming renewable electricity? So this is an accounting problem. Now here's a cartoon picture of what uh, an electrical grid is like. Um, let's just for simplicity assume that uh, uh, we have uh, a company like Google and it has a constant demand. Not strictly true, but it's just, you know, let's just uh, do it to make it easier. So that's that blue line, the demand equals one power unit of, of in some units. Um, uh, in order to be, in order to consume renewable power, uh, a large company will engage in something called a PPA, a power purchasing agreement, and will will contract with um, uh, renewable uh, power providers like a, a solar power farm or a wind farm, and they'll give us electricity, but they can't really control when the sun shines or when the wind blows. So they'll give us as much electricity as they can generate, but it might not match the demand. Here's a, here's a, this orange curve is the typical curve that renewable power might give over a week. And sometimes there's, it generates a lot and sometimes it generates not very much. And so when our, now of course we're participating in the grid and when our, uh, 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 the renewable uh, power sources are below what we need. We have to essentially use extra power that are filled in from just other grid sources. Now, when there's too much renewable power right now, uh, that that typically gets used by other people. So uh, because we're all participating in the grid. So how do we measure this? Well, um, back in 2017, there was a nice easy metric that we used. Um, and that was you take the area under the orange curve, which is the total amount of energy uh, generated by the renewable um, power. And then you divide it by the area under the blue curve, which is just the demand. Uh, you assume that any excess gets used by someone else and they'll and will decarbonize them. And so if on the average, your renewable energy is equal to your demand energy, then on the average, you're zero carbon and everything is fine. And in fact, that's the situ that's been the situation at Google since, um, uh, 2017, that computation in these data centers is net zero carbon. Now, of course, that orange curve and that blue curve get averaged over the entire year for the statement and over all uh, of the global locations. So if this is the way you account for it, uh, currently um, Google data centers are net zero carbon. That implies, if you uh, use this metric, that um, uh, when you train an ML or AI model on a Google data center, it's essentially ha has no carbon cost. Now that's not the best metric in the world. It isn't future proof because what's going to happen into the future is that extra uh, renewable power, everyone's going to try to decarbonize. And so when more and more renewable e energy is coming onto the grid, even as we speak, and therefore, there's something called curtailment, where people start throwing away the renewable power because too much of it's generated and no one wants to use it. So we can't rely in the future on the fact that, oh, someone is going to pick up this renewable power and it's OK. So we've come up with a new metric called carbon-free energy. And what that is, is um, you, you sort of don't count the excess. If, there, if we generate, if we buy renewable power and it, it's excess, it doesn't, doesn't count for anything. That's the assumption, so it's conservative. For all those green dips, you uh, measure the you you measure the uh, carbon intensity. In other words, how many how much carbon dioxide per unit energy the grid produces times the amount of energy we actually use. So that's sort of the CO two needed to generate that green amount of energy, and you divide it by the demand energy, uh, uh, assuming that the orange is completely carbon free, which it is. So uh, this is a much better metric. And, uh, for the future, uh, because it really reflects uh, the, the 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 carbon impact of any um, you know any activities, and in fact we have a goal to drive this metric to zero by 2030. So it's going to be tricky, right? That means that uh, either we have to use no grid energy, or the grid energy itself has to has to go to zero carbon. So it's tough. Um, 
so uh, there's an interesting lesson here, which is, so this is a better metric. It's more conservative. And in fact, uh, there was a paper by Dave Patterson and a number of other Googlers that uh, took this metric and used it to figure out, uh, oh, how much carbon does it require to uh, train a machine learning model or an AI model? So let's dig into that. You know, that paper's an archive and I welcome everyone to read it. But if we dig in, you'll see that, uh, let's pick one of the models. It's not one of the, the largest ones, but it's a it's a definitely a large one. It's 130 million parameters, uh, happens to be a language model. Um, how much carbon does it take if you wanted to train that 100 times? So you, you might be making mistakes, you might be retraining on new data. So you have some model, it doesn't have to be a language model, maybe it's a climate, uh, a climate project model. And if it has 130 million parameters and has that architecture, and you retrain it 100 times, you get just about two metric tons of CO2. Well, on the scale of things, that's actually pretty small because even a small climate project, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute, or I'll talk about the size in a minute, you, you want to save something like 3,000 metric tons. So, so if you're going to use AI to um, uh, work on climate, don't worry about the CO2 burden. Don't fear the, don't fear the Reaper. Don't fear the AI CO2 burden uh, because it'll be small compared to the savings that you'll, you'll typically get. Uh, so how, so the CFE metric uh, getting to zero or getting to hundred percent carbon free is, is, uh, tough. Um, uh, so let me tell you about an interesting project that we've done called carbon aware computing by my colleagues, Anna Radovanovich, uh, Ross Koenigstein and many others across many parts of Google, where we're trying to drive that metric to be optimal. So, sorry, it should be 100% CFE, but how do you, how do you reach, how do you reach 100% CFE by 2030? Um, well, you can optimize. Let me explain what I mean. Here is another uh, visualization of CFE. Uh, it's a 2D visualization where uh, the X axis is day of the year and the Y axis is time of day. So essentially it's 8,760 pixels lined up in columns. Uh, green means that it's great, it's 100% carbon-free energy. Zero uh, means that it's it's still quite carbon-filled. Um, uh, this is a plot from our um, uh, data center in Iowa. And Iowa's great because it's in the United States Midwest, and there's plenty of wind power in the, in the Midwest of the United States because the wind blows very strongly off the Rockies. But in the late summer, you can see that uh, it kind of, the winds kind of dies down, and so we have to rely on on uh, 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 fossil fuel power to power that uh, data center. So what 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 can we do if we want to run if we want to run in that data center uh, a do job, let's say a, a training job? Well, uh, uh, imagine that little I don't know if you can see it. This little pink box here is the training job we want to run noon sometime in the late summer in Iowa. And let's say some jobs you can't really do much about. Uh, they're interactive jobs or they're business critical, like you have to answer a search query right away. You can't wait. But one thing you can do if you're training and you don't need it right away is time shift, right? So that's moving this, this uh, red box down to this blue box when uh, you know, during the day, maybe the wind is slack, but during the nighttime, maybe the wind picks up, which in fact is true in, in, in Iowa. So if you have a lot of data in Iowa and you want to train a machine learning model, you just wait. And in fact, there's uh, optimization uh, code. It's quite messy because the you can't write down a single optimization function, but there's essentially um, methods to, to push uh, uh, jobs that can wait to wait until the grid is is more green. So that's one possible thing to do, time shifting. One thing we, we announced recently was space shifting. So there we have multiple data centers, right? I mean, you might have a lot of data in Iowa or maybe your job doesn't require a lot of data. Maybe it's, you don't need, you don't care where your, your, your job runs. So you could, and if you want it to be quick, you might want to pick up your job at noon in Iowa and drop it down in North Carolina at that same time and not wait. And you can see North Carolina has a funny pattern, maybe because of solar power, where during the middle of the day, uh, it's quite green. Um, but then at nighttime, it slacks off and it requires more uh, more fossil fuel. So we you can move your job from someplace that's wind intense to someplace that's solar intense. 
And that's another thing that we've implemented and that we've written the optimization code and just announced. So that's pretty cool. Um, so um, the lesson I took from that is that load shifting works, right? That that CFE score varies uh, actually 46% over the hours of a day. Even if you can't move your, your job, um, um, you can wait until a better time. And from uh, from location to location, if you can actually move uh, the, the the computer job, it goes from anywhere. And we published uh, this cloud uh, this data about our data centers from three percent up to ninety one percent. So if you can move it to a greener data center, then um, um, that's better. Now you can try this too. You can obviously um, run jobs on the Google Cloud, and we'll try to do our best to to make it be um, uh, uh, carbon uh, carbon efficient. But you might not have, a, you, you, you as an engineer, if you're listening, you might not want to do computing, you might want to do something else, but you might be able to time or space shift it. So you need uh, uh, to, to um, do something similar to what we did. So you'll need spatial and temporal predictions of carbon intensity. So we don't, we actually uh, didn't generate this uh, ourselves. There are specialist um, companies and nonprofits, um, namely Tomorrow and Watt Time, that actually have APIs for, this kind of carbon intensity, and you can um, um, play with their data and see if you can also sh load shift. And if everyone does that, then we can uh, sort of collectively drive our 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 uh, carbon free energy scores to be optimal. Okay, so that brings me to the urge to help. Um, that project from Anna and Ross and all the other folks did come about because of. Um, uh, an urge that the, the engineers wanted to have, make an impact on carbon. And that's a good urge. Uh, and it's very common. I, I get a lot of people inside of Google who come and say, gee, I really want to work on climate change. What shall I do? In fact, Eugene, who introduced me and Cassandra, left Google to work on work on climate.org. And that was good. Uh, and so they're providing a public service. But, you know, if we get thousands or millions of engineers, uh, there are millions of engineers in the world, but if you get many, many thousands of engineers who all want to stop doing what they're doing and work in climate change, it's not clear that scales because it's not clear that there, there are enough high impact projects to sort of support uh, many, many tens of thousands of engineers all working on climate change. So how do we make this scale? Well, I like to look at ratios. Um, because that's, uh, I like to think about leverage for climate change. So here's, here's one possible leverage. In the United States, depending on how, again, accounting, depends on how you measure it, but there's about 5.8 billion tons of CO2 equivalent emissions per year. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics in the US, there's about 2 million non-computer science engineers uh, working in the United States. So if we split up the problem, that means that every engineer, computer or not, let's say, should try to fix 3,000 tons per year. So that's the lesson that I learned for, uh, from watching what Anna and Ross and the others did, is think about optimizing as part of your job, right? Engineers have a lot of core expertise. They really understand, when I talk to them in general, they really understand the domain deeply. So if everyone stays in their job, uses their expertise, and attempts to save 3,000 tons per year, we could really make a dent in this problem. It might not be able to solve the whole problem because some of it has to do with, well, there's just a coal plant and it's producing CO2, but this would be a great goal. So if you want to know what should, what can, if you're asking me, what can I do? I would say, stay in your job and figure out whether you can save 3,000 tons per year of CO2. It's, it's not a tiny amount, but it's not a gigantic insurmountable amount. And you may be able to use AI to, to solve that. Um, now, where are some resources? In fact, I mentioned work on climate.org. They have a Slack channel and they have access to experts. So you could try to uh, look there to see if there's an interesting, you can learn uh, if there's interesting ways for you to save CO2 as part of your current job. There's also climatechange.ai. Uh, uh, Eugene mentioned that there's an overview paper. They have tutorials and organized conferences and they have some data sets that they're, they're putting together. So again, I would encourage everyone to, to think of how they could save 3,000 tons a year in their own job. Okay. So, so I talked about the fact that the burden of AI, the CO2 burden of AI is not high, and that you uh, people should be aiming for 3,000 tons. But what 
what can we do? What I, I, it's been super vague so far. Now, again, I only, uh, I don't have a lot of time in this talk, so I can't go through and enumerate everything, but I can, here's, here's a problem. Everyone, including myself, uh, this is not, uh, I'm not pointing fingers. I, I uh, fall into this too. Everyone loves to use the AI hammer and are there, you know, what can we do? It's like the AI is the movable, uh, is the irresistible force and climate's the, 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 the immovable uh, object. So can we use our favorite AI hammer to pound on some climate application nails? And the answer is yes, but not all climate and not all possible applications. So what I've seen in, in uh, Google and around when I talk to other people is there's kind of three styles of successful AI climate applications. And, I, and so there's like three buckets uh, because it sort of plays to the strength of AI. Uh, the first one is making autonomous climate aware decisions, right? AI or machine learning is good at uh, doing, making decisions autonomously. So what we have to do is uh, uh, enable uh, those decisions to be, uh, be a climate aware or climate positive. Uh, machine learning systems, especially uh, on, in large data centers are very good at just large scale computations. Uh, and so what I found useful is um, either the large scale sensing of the world to figure out where the climate problems are and try to correct it, or large scale modeling of the world again to figure out how to intervene uh, either for climate adaptation or climate mitigation. Let me let me make these concrete. Uh, what do I mean by autonomous climate uh, decisions? Um, uh, here's an example. Uh, DeepMind, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, announced that uh, they figured out how to uh, control using um, um, an agent trained uh, with machine learning, uh, the data center cooling. Uh, data center cooling, I mean, m most of the uh, electricity and power used in um, data centers is to actually go for computing, but some of it goes to cooling. And if you let the ML uh, control the amount of cooling and uh, the location and amount of cooling, you can save about 40% of the energy, um, which is good. So this is this is an example of, of, of using machine learning to um, save energy uh, that would otherwise goes to waste. And again, I think if engineers want to, if there's, if there's low hanging fruit, you might need machine learning or maybe even not, um, um, where we could say everyone saves a moderate amount of CO2, then I think we can make a lot of progress. An example of large scale sensing in the world is something called Project Sunroof, um, now part of a, a Google product called Environmental Insight Explorer, although originally it was uh, a, a project from my colleague, uh, uh, Carl uh, uh, Elkin. So in Project Sunroof, um, uh, what Google did was it took aerial photographs of towns or cities and it estimated if you installed uh, uh, photovoltaic on your roof, how much money would you save? So what it did is it, it, it found the roofs of the houses you can see in yellow and it, and it computed what the angles of the, of the roofs were. And so it figured out how much, where the optimal place to put uh, photovoltaic and how much money would be saved for that. So here, for example, there's some random house uh, where you would save $12,000 if you put PV on it. And it would just tell people about this. So this is an example where there was large scale sensing of the world and that information would come in feedback and, and, and help people make better decisions uh, about how to save, uh, how to be more renewable and less fossil fuel. Now, large scale modeling of the, uh, of the world, I think is very exciting. I'm gonna talk about one application um, because the world is actually a very complicated place. And if we want to make interventions or do adaptations, we really need to have good models of the world. Let me, let me give you a, a concrete example. Um, and that's uh, our flood forecasting project. Um, and this is work by uh, our, the, the flood forecasting initiative uh, with Selenevo and his team. Now, flooding is a very large uh, problem even now. You know, billions of people are impacted by floods every year. Um, um, you know, billions of dollars of damages. And it's just going to get worse with um, climate change. Climate change on average is going to increase the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. So it's going to increase the amount of sort of severe precipitation and flooding. Although in some parts of the world, it's actually going to dry it out, especially like in Mediterranean climates, but in other places, it's going to increase the amount of floods. So getting people out of harm's way is very important. 
So how does flood forecasting work? Well, for purposes of a keynote, there's essentially three pieces. There's a hydrological model where we figure out uh, where the water in an area is going and how much water there is. And then once you figure out how much water there is in a river, we run a hydraulic model to figure out whether that river is going to overflow and if it's going to uh, get into, into you know, inhabited areas. And then there's a warning distribution um, a system, which is already part of Google, which uh, gives people alerts that something, something bad is about to happen in their area. So the hydrologic model is interesting. Um, there's many different physical processes that go into it. Obviously, there's precipitation and evaporation. There's actually water that gets absorbed underground and it percolates. So not all water flows downwards uh, at the surface. Some of it goes underground. And also there's you know snow melt, so it's, it's all very time varying. Now, the, in the classic approach, and this is, this is a pattern I've seen a lot. In the classic approach, what you do is you kind of write down a very complex physical model that consists of many, many smaller physical models, like an evaporation model, a storage model, a evapotranspiration model for trees. And you try to calibrate each individual piece, and you kind of slam it together and hope the whole thing works. Uh, it's conceptually simple. You can check to see, yes, I have all, all the different uh, physics that I've captured. But it's over-parameterized, right? In other words, there's many, many parameters you have to tune, and there's a lot of uncertainty typically in these parameters. Uh, and then, of course, you have to manually calibrate each one. Um, now, you can replace the hydrological model, and, and Sela and his team have done so, where you don't really, you have almost no explicit, you have a little bit of explicit modeling. And in fact, what they did is they took an LSTM to do a time series prediction. So they just looked at some um, sensors and some gauges and then tried to predict how much water there would be in the river at a particular time. And again, not, not with a lot of evaporation or snow melt or any, any kind of uh, um, specific modeling like that. And in fact, they have this very nice um, architecture called Hydronets, which is an LSTM which kind of looks like a river. So there's like little LSTM pieces. And then when the multiple branches of the, of the river kind of join together, uh, the multiple branches of the software and the LSTM kind of work and then sort of generate and propagate the state. So that's very nice. So there is some structure, right? It's not like it's completely a blank neural network. You're trying to sort of take a very broad river model and put it into the architecture, but there are not a lot of specific physics pieces. And that works very well. You can see actually down lower to the right, the, the Hydronets model actually has a, a, a better precision and recall for floods uh, versus uh, uh, essentially very specific models that were sort of tuned per basin. Now, once you have the hydrological models, you, um, uh, plug, you plug in, or Sela's team plugs in uh, to this public alerting system. So uh, inside of search and maps, and in fact, Android, they're just uh, alerts where um, um, you can say, oh no, there's gonna be a flood in your current location, you know, go to higher ground. And so that is a, a way that uh, local uh, authorities can help emerge, uh, communicate emergency messages. And this is live already. Um, this is live in India, <coughs> excuse me, and has triggered on different floods and has helped people avoid getting um, hurt because floods are quite dangerous. Now, what's the lesson here? Uh, this is my last lesson uh, for the day. And that's to imp replace this imp these empirical models with machine learning. These empirical models, um, I've seen, uh, you know, it's not just floods. I've seen them in many different sort of climate related um, or even energy related uh, engineering fields where um, a lot of them date back to say the seventies and people put them together calibrating the individual pieces, maybe on not very much data. And then they became uh, relatively entrenched in the, in, the, um, in the field and they worked, you know, okay, but um, now we have a lot more data, uh, we have a lot more compute. And so by gathering much more data, we can have models like Hydronet, which sort of have enough, just enough physics or just enough like the structure of the river without over specifying it. And that tends to be much more accurate than these old sort of empirical granular models from uh, 30 to 50 years ago. So if we're gonna work on world models for climate, I think this is actually a trick. So I'll encourage you, uh, in your in your job, if you see that people are using these kind of old empirical models, if we can replace them with machine learning, we can do a lot better. Now, part of why I like or what I want uh, from a world model 
is a climate what if. Now, I don't have this yet, uh, but um, uh, what I want is a, a, a tool where it says, well, where should we plant trees? Because it turns out planting trees to fix carbon dioxide isn't a uniform climate good. Um, some places it actually, like towards the poles, it actually hurts the climate to plant lots of trees. Should we uh, paint our roofs white? Should we put photovoltaics on it? Should we put, put trees on our roofs? You know, this is this is all an open question. Should we plant kelp? You know, all these interventions. Um, uh, now you can say, can't we just run climate models to do this what if? Well, here's the problem with today's climate models is they have a huge amount of initial condition noise, right? Climate models are, the climate system itself is chaotic so that, um, uh, you know, a small perturbation of initial condition leads to two very different states. So you, it, you can't just do an alteration uh, of, a, uh, of a climate model, like an initial condition or a boundary condition, like a number of trees, and then just do a naive uh, 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 delta uh, because it, you, you don't know whether that delta was caused by the trees or just by random fluctuations that ended up in a different space. So you have to repeat the, the, the running the climate model many times, and you have to uh, typically use very, very large perturbations. Um, for example, uh, uh, Ken Caldera back in 2009 wrote a paper about trying to figure out the effect of trees. And the only way he could get signal really was to essentially in the model, get rid of all the trees north to 50 degrees north or get rid of all the trees in the tropics, just because you need to have huge signal to kind of pull out from the initial condition noise. So I'm hoping that machine learning can actually, um, you know, build these kind of climate what if uh, models. And so I, I'm actually excited about the possibility of doing world modeling from for many different problems, both for mitigation and, and for adaptation. Okay, well, that brings me to the end of my talk. So let me just review the six lessons learned um, uh, that, that, that I've learned over the last few years at Google. Uh, again and again, climate cha change boils down to accounting. So if you're working on some aspect of climate change, make sure that the metrics are correct because it's very easy to fool yourself or to do the wrong thing unless you carefully design your metrics. Don't worry about the AI CO2 burden. If you're working on climate, the, the gains you'll get from even a small climate change problem will be a lot larger than the, uh, the CO2 you'll need to, to burn in order to uh, uh, generate the AI. Load shifting seems to work. It works for Google. Maybe it'll work for you too if you have a, a situation where you can shift things around easily and space your time. And if we all do that, then then we're, we'll all be collectively doing what they call demand response and then matching all of our uh, electricity demand to the supply that renewables has. One thing I encourage everyone to do is optimize as part of your job. Um, again, if everyone does 3,000 tons a year, in theory, that solves the problem, or at least it'll make a lot of progress. So use your expertise as an engineer. You don't have to go and abandon what you're doing uh, to go be a climate person. Uh, just be a climate aware engineer. Um, uh, I shared the three styles of AI climate applications. That's uh, climate aware, uh, uh, autonomous climate aware decisions like tuning up the data centers. That's uh, doing large scale world sensing like Project Sunroof. Or there's world modeling like um, uh, the flood forecasting. Again, those are the three buckets that I've seen that were successful. And one thing I encourage everyone to do is to replace empirical models, especially these empirical models about the world, with ML, because that seems to actually make them both be faster, more efficient, and also um, um, more accurate. OK, um, that's my talk. Uh, I'm happy to get questions from the audience that I think Eugene will tell me about. Yeah, thank you so much, John. Uh, so um, it doesn't look uh, like attendees have submitted questions, but uh, I just want to comment on a few things you said and see maybe that will trigger some discussion. So I, I really like the taxonomy you proposed uh, that the possible applications of climate, uh, of AI and climate are you know, related to climate aware decisions, sensing and modeling. And mm -hmm. uh, this makes a lot of sense for me. So for example, modeling, uh, modeling basically is important for any kind of risk assessment, which is critical to be able to protect the assets at risk because protecting everything broadly is infeasible, but once you know where the risk is, suddenly you can protect things. For example, you can insure homes if you know which ones are at risk of wildfires. Uh, 
uh, or, or floods. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, um, large scale sensing is important for uh, measuring emissions and um, for measuring the impact of carbon offset projects. And we have several examples of that in the program. So for example, we had climate trace yesterday, uh, which measures emissions uh, from satellites. And on the other hand, uh, today we have Silvia Terra, which measures forests from satellites, uh, which is you know really important to be able to issue carbon offsets. Um, yeah, by the way, I want to also give a shout out uh, to Google here for being, as far as I know, the world's largest non-government purchaser of carbon offsets. So like, uh, that's another way in which a tech company can be a catalyst of the ecosystem. And uh, yeah, the, the other bucket you mentioned was autonomous climate aware decisions. Uh, and I think a lot of the other stuff kind of falls into that. For example, like improving energy efficiency, uh, like uh, Resync does falls into that. You could argue that uh, like robotic recycling that Amp Robotics does or like predicting demand for groceries uh, like Afresh does kind of falls into this bucket. So yeah, it uh, seems to be a really neat taxonomy. So John, I think I wanted to ask you a couple of uh, questions. Uh, so um, one, um, yeah, like how would you advise uh, engineers and ML professionals to choose like whether to join the sort of uh, rapidly growing climate uh, tech ecosystem or whether to try to find a way to do the 3000 tons a year inside their company? Um, so I would say there's a couple of factors that go into that. Um, one is, do they have access to something like 3000 tons? I think many people do because a lot of, I was just looking at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, many, many engineers uh, work in manufacturing, which obviously moves atoms around and therefore it could be optimized. So if you have access to, to doing a few thousand tons a year, you know, use your expertise and stay. Um, if you have uh, more, it, if you have more of a, a physics background or um, that, that, or um, um, like energy background, then maybe you go into the climate tech thing. Um, I, I, I would advise. See, the trouble is, in order to be climate tech, in order to be a sustainable business, needs to both find a it's it's complicated right because right now there isn't a global sort of price on carbon so it's there isn't a giant economic incentive to work on climate tech you can try to find individual uh it, um specific sectors and maybe that's enough but right now there isn't a sort of a, i mean there's a lot of concern about climate but there isn't a global uh uh, uh push towards working on climate precisely because there isn't an economic there isn't a strong enough economic pull because there isn't a, a, a large enough uh, uh, um, car global climate incentive in terms of like a carbon tax or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say, you know, if you're in, uh, you know, if you have some special expertise uh, for like in chemical engineering or physics or energy, then go and definitely look at uh, climate tech. But if you're a a more generic mechanical engineer or computer scientist and stuff, you might want to stay in your job and try to figure out how to save those 3000 tons a year. Again, sort of like following your expertise and also how easy it is for, for, for it to, to change in the, in the situation you're in. So it's kind of hard. It's kind of hard. I can't make like a global, like everyone should rush and do it or no one should do it. It's, it, it's kind of it depends on the individual. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting, uh, John, what, what you're saying kind of disagrees with what uh, I am seeing when talking to climate employers in the ecosystem. Basically, like they seem to be good on the experts, but uh, everybody really, really wants to hire just like general purpose data engineers, ML engineers, and they don't seem to need any climate expertise for them. Like they have climate experts. They just want to they, they just want good engineers, honestly. Oh, that's interesting. I, I don't know that I, I may be, you know, uh, maybe I have uh, a biased estimate of, of what mm -hmm. needs to happen. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, yeah, there's definitely several perspectives uh, on this. Uh, and yeah, you're, you're right, like that the global climate push is uh, not yet at the place where it needs to be. But there's also, I think, like more than most people think. So while there isn't a global carbon price uh, yet, uh, there is a lot going on in finance. And, uh, you know, like dozens of percents of investors are already turning away companies that don't have sustainability goals. Like the major central banks are forcing banks to, to estimate their climate risks uh, and so on. So that, that, that's, that's right. Mm -hmm. you, you brought up you brought up things like climate trace. I think that's right because mm -hmm. one thing I didn't have time for in my talk was to talk about kind of the uh, the interesting. So so uh, uh, capitalism kind of works. 
at its own time scale, right? Because collectively, when we participate in markets, uh, uh, markets kind of have a different a different decision criteria than 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 individual humans, and you can go into the psychology of this. But you know, the long term discount rate, the long term interest rates of uh, uh, in risk freeze uh, hovering in real terms is about two point two five percent which means that capitalism cares what happens in about 45 years. Now, if you go forward in 45 years, that's 2066, mm -hmm. which is already starting to, you know, 20 by 2066, the damages are really starting to mount. Mm -hmm. And so this is why sort of capitalism back propagates from 2066 to now, which I think is part of the reason why we're seeing that people are starting to banks and finance and things like 45 years is a short enough time where it's like, uh oh, this is actually going to start to affect us. So mm -hmm. that's why I think things are swinging right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, that is uh, that is very fair. Uh, so actually, while we were talking, a couple of people submitted uh, some questions. Mm -hmm. So somebody says, uh, "I work on emissions accounting software. Uh, do you know of any examples of applying ML to that kind of raw data? For example, fuel utilization." Oh uh, well, I know you mentioned. Did Climate Trace already give a talk? The, yeah, the, they gave the, a talk yesterday. Yeah. I missed it, I'm afraid. Uh, yeah, they're already, I mean, uh, they're already using machine learning to kind of, uh, with this, with a sort of uh, very wide scale sensing to sort of mm -hmm. keep track. So, so using machine learning to even just know where the, the, the emissions are is really good. And, and there's a fair amount of machine learning also happening in things like methane. Methane is super important because it's such a large greenhouse gas and we can turn it off more easily than CO2. So mm -hmm. there's a fair amount of uh, machine learning happening in things like trying to attribute methane back to, mm -hmm. back to sources. Yeah, uh, there actually is a talk on the topic by Kairos Airspace, uh, yes. I think on Thursday. Uh, regarding specifically fuel utilization, uh, today we have trucks uh, which are going to be talking about using AI to, uh, I think, understand emissions from trucks. Uh, so I think that might be related to. Uh, so um, I guess, yeah, uh, combined between uh, John's uh, answer and my perspective. Yeah, I think the answer to the person who asked the question is, yes, there are such examples. And uh, another person asks, uh, do you have any tips for people working in more traditional environmental spaces wanting to move into climate tech? Um, more traditional climate change. Actually, uh, I think so, because I think a lot of what, I mean, the, in the long term, a lot of what seems to be stymieing things is policy, right? I mean, mm -hmm. if, if we could swing to a place where we can unleash sort of the economic and creative juices of all these engineers, then, uh, if, if it became, you know, if, 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 it doesn't have to be a climate tax, but but mm -hmm. or carbon tax. But if we could get it to it, if we could get the world to a point where where uh, there were policies in place where everyone will want to rush to climate tech because that's the, you know there's lots and lots of money and demand to be made, that would be great. So trying to figure out how to set up that situation uh, might be the most helpful thing for someone in a more traditional, um, especially in environmental activism or advocacy thing. You could you could you know transfer into that, and that would be a uh, very high leverage. You don't necessarily have to work on the technology, but working on the on the environment to make sure that everyone's technology will sort of mm -hmm. go to market. That that mm -hmm. that would be awesome. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you, John. And uh, to add to this a little bit, so another thing I'm seeing uh, when looking at uh, the startup ecosystem. There is a lot of startups who want to help corporates with uh, their sustainability goals. So like they want to help them measure emissions and make plans for reducing them and uh, like understand their supply chains and so on. And uh, on one hand, they are just hiring good engineers. Uh, but on the other hand, they also really want people with sustainability expertise. So they want people who like understand how to do carbon accounting and so on. And they want these people to work with the engineers to automate it. So yeah, if you, you know, have a degree in that, uh, you're going to be in demand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, car carbon accounting is very, as I was saying, it's all about accounting. It's very tricky. Yeah, um, and uh, John, uh, one more one more question, I think, uh, before we uh, finish. So can you think of perhaps some non-obvious examples of uh, how one can help climate from uh, one's own company? So uh, I have a couple of uh, examples that come to my mind. For example, I've spent some time talking to people at LinkedIn about how they could highlight climate jobs more uh, or you know, like uh, fintech uh, companies could highlight uh, greener companies more in the portfolios. Uh, so what comes to your mind? Um, not obvious. Um, well, uh, gosh, um, 
uh, let's say, I don't know what generically. I mean, one interesting, I, I don't know if it's, I, I, if I can answer that question directly, it, mm-hmm. you know, you have to think deeply about all the different ways that your company is, is actually generating carbon, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, it may not be obvious if you're obviously if you're, if you're shipping atoms around and so you're you have a big logistics of trucking that would be a, a place but again that's fairly obvious um you, you also something in what's called scope three in terms of what, what are your suppliers are doing is kind of interesting mm-hmm. so so if people are shipping doing large amounts of compute or shipping large amounts of data around uh that could be that could be interesting source uh yeah it's it's sadly it's not that it's unintuitive it's just that often it's not it's hidden right that the that that's why i'm encouraging people to kind of stay in their companies because they say well you could because you know what's going on you can kind of ferret out where all the carbon is whereas someone outside you know i here i am at google i can't tell you in company x mm-hmm. oh uh this is where your your carbon is from uh mm-hmm. going so if if people are kind of like looking around inside their companies and trying to ferret out where the carbon is that could be just very 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 useful so mm-hmm. so it's not i i know that's fairly generic, but I have a sense that there's a lot of non-obviousness in terms of where the, uh, any company's carbon is actually uh, being generated. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, also I think, I'm not sure there is a name for a, a scope of emissions for this, but many companies have to do something with like modifying people's behavior or enabling people to do certain things. And oftentimes uh, like you can uh, help the company modify the behavior in climate friendly ways. So I guess another example that comes to mind is uh, like Autodesk that makes AutoCAD and it's used in the construction industry. And I believe they have a working group that's focused on helping people make energy efficient buildings, which mm. otherwise like they're not gonna do. Um, yeah, yeah we, should, we should have a scope for helping other people uh, yeah. be more, more climate aware, yes, and then quantify that. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, thank you so much, John, for uh, joining us today. Uh, I'm going to end the broadcast because we're a little bit over time, but yeah, this, this was excellent. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Mm-hmm.